So we're going to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 9. And um, see, we want to go from verse 11, in fact, verse 11 to 28. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made. That is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but, by, but, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifers sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean sanctify them so they are outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove that the death uh, of the one who made it, because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every commandment of the law to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled the blood both, uh, sorry, sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law required that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true heaven. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Well, I've been thinking quite a lot just lately about the blood I think blood is a very significant thing. I know that uh, some of us, um, we don't like the sight of blood. Some people, you know, they see it and they're out cold on the floor. Um, and, uh, you know, not, uh, not, not very, um, a, a particularly pleasant subject in many respects to talk about. But one that's so necessary, and blood was such an integral part of the worship of the Israelites, not just the Israelites, let's be honest, many, many communities across the world realized that uh, there was something special about sacrifice. Sacrifice is not something to be taken lightly. 
people actually very often didn't like giving sacrifices. Nothing to do with the shedding of blood, but because a sacrifice is to give something up. And so God demanded that when they made sacrifices, that the animals sacrificed on the altars of the temple had to be certain animals. These animals had to be perfect animals in every way. The rules that were laid down were very, very strict. And yet, of course, as we find the prophets speak out against God's people because they say, God doesn't want your sacrifices. You bring him blind and lame animals and you sacrifice those. And you think God will be pleased with your sacrifice. Now, God demands the best and that costs us. And there would be a lot of people who would look at their herds and their flocks and they would say, why am I giving the very best that I've got when I could keep that for myself? After all, it's only just going to go and be burnt on an altar. Why would I give the best? And I think what that shows us actually is more something of the attitude of the heart than anything else. That when people start to say, I don't want to give my best to God, it shows that we're not actually dedicated to him. And God was not fooled by this. He saw the lameness of the animals. He saw the blindness of them. He saw that they were imperfect creatures. And he said, you're not giving your best. This is not from your heart. You're just serving me now out of duty. I'm supposed to give a sacrifice, therefore, I'll give this thing that's no use to me. That's the kind of attitude. And I think actually that kind of attitude is still around today, that there are many people who don't want to give their best to God. Second best will do. I keep the best for myself. God won't mind. Nobody's going to notice. But, you know, God is not blind. God is not deaf. God understands what's in your hearts. And he knows when you're actually giving second best and not the best that you could offer. And the people of Israel looked at themselves and they said, why is there no blessing? And the prophet said, because you do not honor God. Because you rob God. Because you take away from him the things that actually belong to him. Whether that was the offerings or indeed the tithes that they brought. People were robbing God and they say, and now God doesn't bless us. What's this all about? It reminds me a little bit of... Um, you remember some years ago uh, when there were a spate of shootings in schools in America. Doesn't that sound familiar? And they were asking, where is God in all of this? Why isn't God protecting us? And I, I think it was Anne Graham Lotz who, who actually spoke up and said, you know, we've kicked God out of our schools. We're not allowed to say prayers in schools. We're not allowed to have teaching, Christian teaching in schools. We're not allowed to do any Christian functions in schools. We've kicked him out, and then you ask, why does he not protect us? And it's a good question to ask at every aspect of our lives, is that when we look and we see that God is not blessing, it's not always a sign that God is not there. God allows us to go through difficult times sometimes in order to uh, strengthen us. But there are times in our lives when the blessing doesn't appear to be there. And let's go and examine ourselves and say, before I come to God, have I sorted things out? When we come to the communion, we very often read from 1 Corinthians 11. And what are those words that Paul encourages us with? Let us examine ourselves. A man should examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. Otherwise, says Paul, we may eat judgment and drink judgment upon ourselves if we come in an unworthy manner. And that's right, you know, we don't take this lightly. 
if the people of old didn't take their sacrifices lightly, to the point that very often they wouldn't give the right sacrifice. But when their hearts were right, they wanted to sacrifice only the best. And they kept on sacrificing again and again and again, just to make sure that God had really got the best they could offer. And I think that we need to do the same. As we come to the table, we just say, am I the very best that I can offer to the Lord at the moment? And it's good in that respect for us to examine ourselves, not just when we get to church and find, oh, look, it's communion set up again. Am I ready now? But we need to be prepared for it. I think it's something that we do on a daily basis, actually. We keep short accounts with God. We sort out the problems that we have, and sometimes we get led astray. Sometimes we find ourselves drifting away from God. Well, let's come daily and renew our promises to him, renew our covenants with him. Make sure that our hearts are right for being with him. But I said that I've been thinking about blood. And I've been thinking about, and I've been reading a number of passages throughout Scripture over the last few weeks relating to blood. It's amazing, you know, how much the Bible says on the subject. The Bible speaks of it as being the life blood. The Bible speaks of it as being precious blood. The Bible speaks of it as being something that God values. Human life is depicted as being in the blood. When Cain and Abel had their disagreement over their offerings to God, incidentally. And you remember that poor Abel became the victim of the first murder. And what was it? God spoke and he said, Abel's blood cries out. Abel's blood cries out. The ground that took his blood, he said it's, it, it's absorbed it, but it's crying out. We talk about blood guilt. The Bible speaks of blood guilt. It speaks about the fact of that you know blood is 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 so precious that we have to take great care of it when eating the bible instructs in the old testament that there should be no blood left in an animal and of course from that we get kosher and and of course indeed also halal meat where the blood has been drained out of the meat first because there are communities today that still believe that to be the case that we mustn't eat blood. Why? What was so wrong with blood? Well, some people have said, you know, well, blood can carry diseases, and and that's probably true. And, you know, in preserving uh, uh, um, uh, food, it's, it's wise to take the blood out of it. But I think it's something more than that, actually. God is making a statement. There are a number of things that God tells us to do, tells his people to do, that actually don't make an awful lot of sense unless you understand it as God trying to make a statement to us and say to us, you know, I'm not expecting you to be logical about it. I'm expecting you to be obedient. And in this particular case, I think that what he's saying here is this, that blood is the life of the animal. And therefore, before you eat it, make sure all the life is drained out of it. It's a precious thing. The only blood that you and I are to take, according to Scripture, is the blood of Jesus. Now, that was quite a difficult thing for the followers of Jesus, because when we come into the New Testament and we get to John chapter 6, we find that Jesus has been teaching the people and uh, feeding the people. He's given them bread to eat and fish to eat. He's fed 5,000 of them and they were so excited that out of such a small number, just five loaves and two little fish, that God had produced 
Oh, Jesus had produced so much food for all the people that they came back the next day for more. And Jesus saw straight through them. He says, you're not hungry and desperate now. You're looking for a miracle. And Jesus went on to say, I am the bread of life. But, you know, the people pursued him still more, and Jesus took them deeper and deeper into an understanding of him. And he said this, he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And the people looked and they said, Jesus, this is too much for us. This is too much. We can't take this. We can't possibly think of eating human flesh, cannibalism. That's definitely off the menu. And blood, we do not drink blood. We do not touch blood at all. Blood is something we keep right away from. We mustn't have anything to do with that. And you are telling us to do those things. And of course, Jesus was speaking, not so much in a literal sense, but in a spiritual sense, that we receive him and that when we listen to his teaching, it's just like eating and having our fill. And when his power is poured out upon us, it's just like receiving refreshment and drink. It gives us life. The food that we eat sustains us and helps us to continue our journey. And Jesus said, you, he said, are to mix my blood with your blood. My life into your life. The two are to be fused together. So that's what I want for you. And I think that as we come to the communion table, let us remember that Jesus gave this incredible sacrifice for us. And he said, keep remembering it. Don't ever forget this. This is so important. Of all the things that I teach you and all the things that I've, I've uh, instructed you, this is so important that I'm going to get you to do this on a regular basis. And there's going to be a little bit of symbolism involved in it so that you never forget. Jesus doesn't say that about other areas of his teaching. Jesus doesn't speak about the Beatitudes and say, now, whenever you come together, you are to repeat the Beatitudes. He doesn't say that. Or any of his other teachings. He doesn't even say, now, I want you to make sure that once a month, you read the story of the Good Samaritan to remind you how you should treat one another and indeed strangers as well. He doesn't say that. But he instructs us. He says, never give up taking this simple meal. This is so important. This is at the heart. This is the key that my blood was poured out for you. A perfect sacrifice. Now, the Bible gets talking a lot about covenants. And very often, we go a little bit cold when we start talking about covenants. And I know the kind of attitude that we might have, you know, the kind of ideas in our minds, thinking, oh, why do we need to talk about covenants from thousands of years ago? What relevance are they today? Well, the truth is, you know, that covenant is written into the very fabric of our scriptures. Only we call it Old Testament, New Testament. But the word testament literally means covenant. Old covenant, new covenant. And you need both. And I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of the, the old covenant, what bits remain and what, what bits have been fulfilled, because it's quite clear that there are certain bits of the old covenant that we no longer have to keep. They've been fulfilled in Christ. And there are bits of the Old Covenant that we clearly should still keep. So therefore, we no longer have animal sacrifices. Perhaps that's the most obvious of them all. There's no more animal sacrifice because Christ has become our Passover lamb. But at the same time, there is a commandment that says, do not murder. 
and we haven't said that's been abolished and now it's all right because Christ was killed we can now go and kill anyone we like that that doesn't apply so so there is this teaching but we haven't got time to go into that today so don't take on block and say the whole of the Old Testament is relevant, the whole of the Old Testament isn't relevant today. It all still applies and it's all still relevant. It's just that some of it now, under the new covenant, has been fulfilled once and for all. And that's the essence of what the writer to Hebrews says in chapter 9. He says there are many things that we used to do under the old covenant, but now he says we don't need to do them anymore. He says, Christ has gone, been our sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, and has entered into the holy place. Not just that, but the most holy place. Now, in the temple, there was a room, and uh, right at the heart of the temple, called the most holy place. And as we've just read here, the priest used to go in once a year. He would go into the temple, uh, into the holy place with the sacrifice, with the blood. And there he would offer up atonement for the people to make them at one again with God. To pay for their, their sins for another year. The guilt of all the people was brought there before God and forgiveness attained it would seem but the writer says now it's different because verse 11 when christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made that is to say not a part of this creation He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Once and for all, he entered into that most holy place. Now, that most holy place, as it was described uh, in some of the instructions on building the temple, etc., you find that it was this perfect little cube of a place it was as broad as it was long as it was high a cube and it says that this little cube that they made in the temple about 30 feet which was what 10 meters wide probably I guess about as wide as as this church and you you might not believe this but actually this little bit of the church here is actually perfectly square Okay, it may not look it, it looks kind of long, doesn't it? But that's the pillars give the illusion. It's actually square, so it's probably about as, as, as wide as this and about as long as, as this. And that was it, that, that there we have the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And the priest would go in there and he says, but Jesus went into not a Holy of Holies built by men, but one built by God. And when he went in, he never came out. He went there forever. He went there once and for all. And of course, you know, at the end of time, we see that God is restoring all things. And the book of Revelation shows that, uh, you know, as all things come together again, that out of heaven comes a new Jerusalem. And the new Jerusalem, it says, comes out of heaven. It starts making its way down to earth. I, I mean, it's difficult to try and explain what this must have looked like. But as it reaches there, a voice speaks and says this. Now the dwelling place of, of God is with men. In other words, sin has been dealt with. It's been eradicated. The only people left are now God's people. And the destruction that had been made right at the beginning when sin entered the world has been dealt with. And now God can make that final union between man and God once again. And so we see this new Jerusalem coming out of heaven towards the new earth. And here is the new city. 
But inside the new city is Christ himself. The interesting thing is that the new Jerusalem is a perfect cube. It's as long as it's wide as it's high. And clearly, when he entered, he went into his new Jerusalem. He started to build the city. Jesus didn't say, I've gone to prepare a place for you, for nothing. Your place is there. It's going to be populated with people who've put their faith and trust in Christ through his blood. It's going to be a city that is full. It's a huge city. I mean, I love the city because when they start to measure it out, it is so big. It is bigger than any city you've ever seen on earth, even by today's standards. I mean, they thought of big cities as being populations of, you know, 250,000 people or something in b- biblical times. That would have been a huge city. Say the city of Ephesus, for example. But now, this city is much bigger. It's interesting that the city was measured. And it was found to be, you know, miles and miles and miles long and wide and high. It needs to be a big place because it's going to be populated with a lot of people. That's good news. But it's only achieved through the blood of Christ that he went once and for all, paid the price and said, now I can build the city. We looked at Abraham last week and we said that Abraham was told that you will possess the land and he went into Canaan, what later became the land of Israel. And he goes into Canaan and he sets up a tent and Hebrews tells us that he never built any foundations. He never made a brick or a stone building, but always lived in tents because he was looking forward to a city that God would build. A city where the foundations are laid by God himself. It's interesting when we start to look at the new things that God is making in Revelation, that it talks about the foundations, and it talks about the 12 layers of foundation that are there beneath the city that is coming out of God. God is making something that is eternal. It needs good foundations. It needs to be strong. Well, when we come to the table, we come to receive not the real blood of Christ, the real body of Christ in the bread and the wine that's before us, but symbols that remind us of the body of Jesus that was broken, the blood that was poured out, that made once and for all the sacrifices that needed to be made, that would cancel the penalty, and the power of sin forever. And that's why I think we take it again and again. It's just to remind us that even though we go on making mistakes, that God doesn't look and say, oops, you made a mistake. That's it, you're out of heaven now. Your name has been crossed off the list. No, not at all. He says, just remember that I did this once and for all for you. But do you believe that? Do you really honestly believe that God has forgiven your sins totally and utterly? How many times, I wonder, do you still feel a little twinge of guilt? And you start to wonder, you know, oh boy, I've done this again, I've done that again. Can God really forgive me? The answer is yes, 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 and yes again. No matter how many times, the answer is yes. When Peter and the apostles came to Jesus and they asked Jesus that difficult question, how many times do I forgive my brother when he sins against me? And the answer was, of course, you never stop forgiving. Seventy times seven. You never stop forgiving. Don't count the forgiveness times. Just keep going. Now, if that's what God expects us to do for one another, how much more does God forgive us? If we confess our sins, 1 John 1, 1.9 tells us, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
today as we come around this table, if you've come to him and you've asked for that forgiveness, if you said, I'm a sinner, I've done things that are wrong, but Lord, forgive me. It's as simple as that. Forgive me. I accept the forgiveness that Jesus offers. You are forgiven. And when you are forgiven, it's like a coin. There are two sides to it. When you are forgiven, the guilt is taken away. The penalty is taken away. The power of sin is taken. The power of sin often holds us as a prisoner. But don't worry. Once you are forgiven, you have the power to overcome through the power that God gives you. And what's more, not only does he forgive all of that, but he then says, and now I'm going to give you new life. See, the ultimate power of sin is death. It's always trying to drag us back into the grave. And Jesus is pulling us away from the grave. He's pulling us towards new life in him. That's why we drink the blood of Christ. Because his eternal life is there in the blood. We do that spiritually speaking, not literally. And so, the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that what we do here, we do as a spiritual act. We drink the blood spiritually, we eat the bread spiritually, we do it by faith, in other words. That we accept that what Jesus did for us in his perfect sacrifice on the cross still counts and is valid for today. No exceptions. It's valid today for each and everyone who trusts in him.